We're proud to announce you. Kids forever. Help Rotary make history at npolionow.org. Tulsa, today we've done our best to put together a, an inspiring and entertaining program, and so you'll be di delighted that you're here today, I'm sure. To start our meeting, past president Matt Davis will provide the invocation and lead us in the pledge, and then Roger Dunham will introduce our visitors. Once again, thanks to Phil Armstrong and Chuck Wilson, we have some special music today, one of our favorite performers and a Crescendo alum, and I'll hold the suspense and not say his name yet. But in any event, there will be, again, no club singing, but again, keep practicing. We will be singing soon. <laughs> and now our invocation by past president Matt Davis, who will also lead us in the pledge. Will you join me in prayer? This is excerpted from a national prayer of reconciliation. Gracious and merciful God, the problems facing our human family are very grave and we are no longer isolated from one another. We are confronted daily with our addiction to violence, our hatred, and our greed. We are heartbroken. We ask you for the gift of hope in our lives and know that we need to turn to one another for the confidence and assurance that we will emerge from situations that in the short term seem hopeless. Banish fear and anxiety from our hearts prompt us to be beacons in the present darkness and especially beacons to one another. Bless us with a peaceful spirit and a desire to be reconciled with one another. It is in your holy name that we pray, amen. And please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now Roger Dunham will introduce our visitors. I hear we have a good list today, Roger. If you don't know where you are, you're at Rotary. Welcome, we're glad you're here. If you don't recognize me, it's because the first time I did this was 31 years ago and I had dark hair. As a matter of fact, I had hair. <laughs> And I didn't need glasses. So something's changed in those 31 years, but it is my privilege, and I'm delighted to get to do this. Let me do this if I might. Whenever I introduce you, if you'll stand with your guest, and then we'll wait for everybody to have been introduced before we applaud. So let me ask. Jeff Hassel has with him Sam Clancy. Would you stand? There he is right over there. And Tina Kosoin. Welcome, Tina. Brian Bovard has with him Susan Pierce, right there in the middle. Also, Bob Deegan, there he is. Tony Oliva has with him Jessica Hudgens. Where are you, Jessica? Right over here to my left. And then he also has Connie Cronley. Hope I said that correctly, a little hard to read. Michael Turner has with him Aaron Wombald. Right to my right. Paul Johnson has with him Amy Miles and Lori Sears. Welcome. Linda Wilson has with her Amy Campbell. My left, about the middle. Jane Zimmel is here with David Downing, also to my left. Jack McGonfey has with him Charles Groom. Where are you, Charles? Over the, way over back in the right. Karen Keith has with her Brett Felter. Is that the correct Pfeiffer. pronunciation? Pfeiffer. Pfeiffer, thank you. Also, Susan Gaysdorf. And Mark didn't write his last name down. Is it Mark Gaysdorf as well? Where are you? Gersdorf. Gersdorf? Way back in the back left, my back left. Next is Rhonda Daniel has uh, Mitty Strain, my left. And Catherine DeCamp has Carolyn DeCamp, that's her daughter. Now then for one more visitor is Roxanne Minnick has her daughter Hannah Minnick. And then when Corey Nickerson has a raft of guests. The first one is Jer Jermaine Jones. 
just remain standing if you would. And then uh, DeAndre Poitier and Rosandra Jones, Victor Thomas, Kayla Jones, JJ Poitier, Gabriel Jones, and Lejean Jones. Welcome. Give all of these folks a wonderful rousing applause. And then from the Broken Arrow Club, we have visiting with us Chuck Gersdorf. Welcome. Come again. Thank you, Roger. Great group of visitors. All these young people here in front. We'll keep you awake, I promise. All right, for our phones out, take notes session today, we do this again so that you'll mark your calendars and invite friends and guests, colleagues to Rotary. Our upcoming programs soon on July 29th, Mike Brennan will be here. He's probably not a household name, but he has an interesting company. He produces pearls all over the world and sells them all over the world. I find that whole thing fascinating, and hopefully you'll have lots of neat things to tell us. On the next Wednesday, August the 5th, is Rick Muncrief, who's the CEO of WPX Energy. It's always good to have the leader of one of our big employers in Tulsa come and speak, so we're looking forward to that. And then long term, again, for you to scribble on your notes or your phone, on August 26th, we'll have Senator Jim Inhofe. On September the 9th, don't forget, we will have who Sports Illustrated has called the greatest women's basketball player ever, Cheryl Miller. On September 16th, we'll have a program on water in the river with Councillor G.T. Bynum. And then on September 30th, we will have a little early childhood focus with a special emphasis in that program on our partner in education, Celia Clinton Elementary, and our former Oklahoma First Lady, Kim Henry, will be our speaker. And finally, on October 21st, be sure you come, our TPS Superintendent, Deborah Gist, will be here. She's been one busy lady. I've bumped into her around town three or four times in the last couple of weeks, so I know she's working really hard. In any event, mark your calendars. That's why the little notepads are on your tables. Grab a notepad, scribble the date, stick it in your pocket, and plan to bring guests uh, to those meetings. Now for our special music. Today, we are privileged to have an opportunity to hear pianist Baron Ryan. And again, thank you to Phil and Chuck for arranging all this great music. That can't be real. Oh, okay. Oh, we have a promise. Most of you know or know of Baron Ryan, so I'll be brief. Baron has been described as a musical phenomenon. I, that's, there's evidence right there. With his passion and love for music being evident in all of his performances. He is the son, of course, of Tulsa pianist Donald Ryan, who we all know. Baron has garnered, though, his own acclaim by delighting audiences across the United States, Israel, Japan, and other countries. Today, he's performing for us, and we're lucky to have him. Please help me welcome the talented Baron Ryan. Thank you. Well, I will accept your challenge of proving that that was not fake before I even play anything. So here we go. Don't blink because you might miss it, but here's, here's the famous Baron Ryan foot grab pose before we actually get started. Thank you. That was unplanned, you got that for free. Now, I'm working on a project right now that I plan to make into a recording, into an album next year called The Master's Apprentice. And in it, I take my favorite jazz pianists and, take, and choose a couple of their, each of their solos and make sheet music, essentially, out of the recordings that they made. So I listen, and then I write down. I don't rack, write down like this. It's actually in a computer. But I have to know what the notes are. And, and then learn their improvisations from the sheet music that I just made. So I'm going to play one of those for you by one of my favorite pianists. His name is Oscar Peterson. And, and this is a tune called Blues Etude. Now before I get there, we have to go through something that's probably going to be the most exciting part of this experience, which is that I will adjust the bench. So please excuse me while I take care of some business here.
trying to clear the smoke out. <laughs> Baron, I couldn't help thinking while you were playing about you putting that on sheet music, and you have to refill the ink in your printer before you print it out, I bet. It's just notes everywhere. Thank you. That was great. You're welcome back anytime. Uh, committee meeting reminder today, the Board of Directors will meet in room 233 after the meeting today to talk about our budget. And so now for our Who Was That segment, it, we have another entry into our Who Was That contest. Uh, this one is a little bit about Alicia. I have to admit, Alicia, that my latest entry is questionable when judged against the four-way test. But it was too tempting for me to pass it up. I want to also say that I propose this not based on anything other than physical appearance. I don't want anyone to think that I think you're like this person. In any event, I ask my question, who was that famous, or perhaps the right term is infamous person, who looks like Alicia? And here is my answer. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> She did some deal with me last week about some screech thing, so I had to... I told you I'd always get the last word. That wasn't really a serious entry. In any event, let me know if you know of someone in the club who looks like someone famous or infamous, and we will add that to our contest. Now, Alicia, I have to give you the microphone to give our messages from today's sponsors. Are you nervous? No. <laughs> <laughs> we need to work on this. Um, our sponsors today, uh, David Moore with Cultural Wealth Advisors, and uh, James Downing. Here we go. David Downing with Acrobat Amp. Um, you know, I didn't know what an Acrobat Amp was, so I had to ask for some clarification, and this is what I got. So that's self-explanatory, an Acrobat Amp. So I had to dig a little deeper. Um, and David sent me their manifesto, and this perfectly explains what Acrobat Ant is and who they are. Um, we speak honestly and simply with a touch of irreverence. We work hard for concepts that are smart, honest, and memorable. We're not satisfied with status quo, so those are ours. We zig when others zag. If there are a car, we do a Volkswagen bug with a candy apple red body, shiny black fenders, and a tan rag top. We're the kid in school who's his own person who does his own thing probably sneaks his smoke every now and then, and stands out because of it. Our words are not boastful, they don't have to be, and our intended message comes across loud and clear. I think I might be an acrobat man. So thank you to our sponsors, um, CMAT Moratorium, if you would like to uh, sponsor Rotary and peacefully speak your fellow Rotarians um, when you need something or a service that they offer. Thanks, Alicia. Our sponsors are a very important element of our budget, and it's a good way for us to promote our businesses with our fellow Rotarians, so please consider being a sponsor. For other announcements, you may recall that in my inaugural address on July the 1st, I talked about how we would work on the Rotary Value Proposition this year, and you may recall the eight steps I suggested for improving the Rotary Value Proposition. One of those eight steps was that we focus more on Rotary International. Another was that we work on delivering the message of Rotary better when we talk to our family and our friends and our colleagues. Rotary International, as you may know, has adopted worldwide areas of focus for the Rotary Foundation that are shown on this slide that Eric's about to pull up. Promoting peace, fighting disease, providing clean water, saving mothers and children, supporting education, and growing local economies. Those are the areas of focus for the Rotary Foundation. As you can see, one of those areas of focus is fighting disease. Of course, the most famous Rotary effort is the effort to eradicate polio. We have today a brief video from Bill Gates giving his perspective on the fight against polio and Rotary's role in that. This video was first played at the Rotary International Convention in Brazil in early June. Congratulations to Rotary on the 30th anniversary of the Polio Plus program. 
Thanks to Rotarian's vision in 1985 of a polio-free world and your unwavering commitment and determination, we've made incredible progress. The world has never been in a better position to eradicate polio. Two of the three strains, wild polio, are now likely eliminated. India was certified polio-free. And Nigeria and the whole continent of Africa are closer than ever before to becoming polio-free. This progress is due to a tremendous global effort of partners, country governments, and Rotarians around the world. The Gates Foundation is committed to the goal of polio eradication, and we are proud of our amazing partnership with Rotary. As we near the finish line, the work is harder than ever, and Rotary's support is more important than ever. You are vital advocates for polio eradication. Thank you for three decades of support for fighting polio and for your ongoing commitment to ensure that no child ever again suffers from this crippling disease. Polio eradication will be a gift for generations to come. If you want to learn more about the Rotary Foundation or what Rotary International is doing, I encourage you, like I always do, to get onto the web, to Rotary International's website, and click on the My Rotary, sign up. It doesn't cost anything, and there is a treasure trove of information, slides, pictures, videos, and everything you could think of. When Rodeo, ro Rodeo, Rotary started Polio Plus, there were 127 endemic countries with more than 350,000 cases a year. Today there are three endemic countries and Nigeria is one of those and is about to be marked off the list if there's not another case of polio for another month. So we're well on the way of having Nigeria be off the list and only having two, those being Afghanistan and Pakistan. So as you can see, the fight continues, but real progress has been made and Rotary International obviously appreciates your support. We also thought just a little bit more about Rotary International. It might be informative for you to see Rotary International's strategic plan. You can see it on the website, but if you don't like to take your time to do that, there are some copies of the plan with a blue piece of paper on your uh, table. There ought to be a couple on each table. If you want to, fold it up and take it home and look at it later. You'll note that there are several elements of the Rotary International strategic plan that were included within the, the goals for the year that I outlined on July the 1st, including encouraging strategic planning, promoting diversity, and enhancing our public image and awareness. So I think we're well in sync with Rotary International itself. Remember, when you go out and tell your friends and your colleagues about Rotary, make sure to brag about the great work of Rotary International and the Rotary Foundation all over the world. For other announcements, if you've not already done so, purchase your Medical Supply Network raffle tickets from Brenda Mellencon, David Peterson, or Ben Wyndham. I bought mine today. I, we can't guarantee a win, but if you do win, it's pretty nice. It's a car. The early drawing has been done for the iPad, but the big prize Mercedes drawing is on October 3rd, I believe, so make sure to buy some tickets. Okay, for a couple of project announcements, Tony Oliva and Terry Heritage have some guests here, and so, uh, uh, well, Tony does at least, to make a Club Foundation grant presentation, and then Terry Heritage will talk a little bit about our partner in education, Celia Clinton Elementary. Tony? Thank you, President Jeff. Uh, on behalf of the club and the foundation and the grants committee, Del Snowberger and I visited with Iron Gate and Connie Crawley and Jessica Hudgens um, and interviewed them for a grant request which was uh, approved in the amount of $2,447. And Connie is here to tell you a little bit about their program and what they're doing with the grant. Um, Iron Gate is a downtown soup kitchen and food pantry in the basement of Trinity Episcopal Church. We've been there 37 years. In a tiny dining room that seats 127 people, we serve six or 700 people every morning. That's a lot of wear and tear on the equipment. And several of our tables have been broken for some time, which mean our, means our guests have had to wait outside in inclement weather, rain and heat. Thanks to Rotary Club of Tulsa, we can now buy three more tables to get all of our guests inside to eat the morning meal. And we invite all of you to come by any day, 8 to 10.30, have a cup of coffee, 
say hello to our poor and homeless guests because we believe that's the first step in bringing us together as a family. Hello, and we say thank you. Come on up, Terry. Thank you, President Bush. I am going to use this as a bully pulpit for just a couple seconds. There are many of us in Rotary that have diminished vision, wet macular degeneration, which I call weapons of mass destruction. If we don't recognize someone, someone doesn't recognize you, it's not because they're being rude. They don't see your face that well. So we're not trying to kiss you. We just have to get close so we can see your face. Thank you. Now on to uh, Celia Clinton. About 10 years ago, uh, when Mike Chittam and I worked together on the Celia Clinton, we discovered that the teachers needed help to help the children. So we started adopt a class or adopt a teacher. We give each teacher $100 for Walmart, 100 for the Apple Learning Center, so they can put their classroom together because we don't have a, a rich group of people that can bring things as some of the other classrooms do. It's a great recruiting tool for the principal, Davis, to get teachers to come there. Uh, you'll find this flyer on all of your tables. So when you make your donation, there's no donation too small and no donation too large. So just make sure you write on the check so that the office can put it in the right bucket, adopt a class. If you need anything else, I know I need to shorten this, you can talk to me or Jerry Murator or John Stava who said he would help me. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Very, very important for us to support our students at Celia Clinton Elementary. All right, I gotta give you the microphone again, Alicia. Welcome our Sergeant at Arms, Alicia Herrera. I just need to say that picture's three years old. I, I challenge you to find the glasses and braces and something that looks like this, so. Um, thank you all. Um, it doesn't exist in nature, it really doesn't. Um, let's see, our first slide, I actually find myself, uh, I took President Jeff very literally when he says phone's out, and my phone was out, and it rang. So I find myself $50, and apparently your fine doubles if your phone rings during prayer, so I'm very sorry for that. So uh, that's where we're at. Um, Phil Armstrong, happy one year anniversary, Phil. He gave $50 for his anniversary. We appreciate you very, very much. Um, so this is something that I thought was interesting. This month, the month of July, we celebrate 529 years of combined Rotary anniversaries. Challenge everyone, give a buck for every year that you've been in Rotary. Um, by the end of the year, we would have 6,880 anniversaries. Or you can do what Phil did and give $50 for every year you've been in Rotary, which would total $344,000. So we have a really big goal this year of $75,000. So if I fail, you all fail. So let's work towards that, please. Um, thank you all very, very much, and contact me if you'd like to pay a fine. Our Rotarian of the day today is past president and one very busy lady, Karen Keith. She's a Tulsa County Commissioner, as we all know. She joined our club in March of 2004. She served as club president in the 2013-2014 Rotary Club of Tulsa year. She's a Club Foundation Fellow and a Paul Harris Fellow. Please welcome our Rotarian of the Day, past president Karen Keith. So do you all want to raise this screen and while I'm introducing our guest, he can make his way up here? I wanted to be very brief but I am very excited about today's guest. 
You know, in our everyday lives, we bump into people who are an instant spark. They absolutely inspire us. And that is the case for me with today's speaker, Emika Naka. His resilience in the face of unimaginable difficulties is remarkable. As a 21-year-old Oral Roberts University student, Emika was injured playing a football game in Fayetteville, Arkansas. That was about six years ago. He was paralyzed from the neck down, but he's made incredible progress. Tulsans have embraced this young man, and he has inspired everyone who crosses his path. It is my great honor to introduce to you the one, the only, Amika Naka. to get back up. When I failed a class at school, you know, and I went back and told my mom and dad, they told me, hey, dust yourself off, you're gonna get back up. But what do you do when you fall and you can't get back up? Let me tell you a little bit about myself. Like Karen said, I was, I, well, I'll tell you this. I was born in Washington, D.C. Me and my family moved to Georgia when I was eight and I moved here to Tulsa in 2007 to go to school at Oral Roberts University. A year later, I joined a semi-professional football team, and that year we won a championship, went undefeated, and the next year in 2009, we were primed to repeat. You know, as a 21-year-old guy, I was living my dream. Any football fans in the house? <laughs> so, in 2009, I, in fact, I'll take you to the day that everything changed for me. It was June 6, 2009. I woke up that morning with breath in my lungs and an excitement about what my life had to offer. We went down to Arkansas. We were playing a game in Arkansas. Uh, that evening, it was the second quarter, midway through the second quarter, kickoff, a play I've made many times before. The ball is kicked off. I'm charging down the field. I shed one blocker, shed another one, and it's me and the ball carrier. I lower my path to make a tackle and crack. He goes down, I go down, he stands up, he stands up, and I can't move. At that moment, it just felt like I had hit a funny bone. If you've ever bumped your elbow, you've hit your funny bone, you get the little tingly feeling in your pinky. You know, I thought I had a stinger or something like that. And I remember reaching up to take my helmet off and not being able to control my arm. My right arm was locked to my body in a muscle contraction and my left arm was flailing from lack of control. Trainers would run out to me and I remember hearing them say things like C5, C6. They're holding my foot up, asking me if I can feel it. And I'm looking at my foot, seeing foot, ankle, chin, knee, thigh. Yeah, that's mine. And I could not feel it. And at that time, I did not know what C5, C6, what all that meant. And it was everyone's worst nightmare. I did not have a stinger. I did not hit a funny bone. I'd broken my neck and suffered a spinal cord injury. Five minutes into this whole ordeal, you know, if things couldn't get any worse, uh, they did. And let me remind you, I just ran down the length of a football field. I have pads on that are fastened securely to my chest and I'm wearing a helmet with a face mask that's kind of blocking my airways. And now paralysis has moved up my legs and into my chest, and my chest muscles are shutting down. I am trying, I am, my breath is getting shallower and shallower, and now every breath becomes like a focused action. Breathing is one of those things that's voluntary and involuntary. For the most part, you breathe, every day you, you're just breathing, taking breaths, you don't even really pay attention to it. But then when you think about breathing, it's kind of, it kind of throws you off your rhythm. I apologize, I see a look around the room, I apologize to some of you guys for throwing you off your rhythm. But um, for me, 
I had to focus on, I want this one. I want that one. And I remember closing my eyes and I'm praying and they're screaming, Mecca, Mecca. And I'm like, what? I'm like, what are you doing? I said, I'm praying. And I'm like, well, pray with your eyes open. God can still hear you. I say, okay. <laughs> Touche, you're right. You're, you're right. You know, so I am now fighting for my life with each breath that I'm taking. And this went on, you know, for, uh, well, this went on for an hour and 18 minutes. Can you imagine breathing, focusing on each breath for an hour and 18 minutes? I got past 100 breaths that I was counting, and just like, you know, I can't count no more. I just have to focus on breathing. At each of our games, is, you know, we have an ambulance by, at each of our games, and this game was no different, but an hour before, a uh, kid had an asthma attack, and that ambulance took that kid to a hospital, so I had to wait for another ambulance to come from another hospital, or from another city. Long story short, ambulance gets there, they strap me to the stretcher, they are wheeling me toward the ambulance, and I can remember that, you know, I've grown up watching sports. I've seen people get injured before. Whether you're being carried off, whether you're limping off, whether you're walking off, you do something to let the crowd know you're going to be okay. You wave your hand, you put your thumbs up, something. As they're wheeling me toward the ambulance, I can remember thinking in my head, like, okay, I got to do something to let everyone know I'm going to be okay. I got to let the fans know I'm going to be okay. I got to let my, my uh, teammates know I'm going to be okay. I got to let the kids know I'm going to be okay. Every fiber of my being was trying to put my thumbs up, and I could not get my thumb up. I could not get my hand up. I couldn't move anything. And it was right there in that moment where I questioned, uh, where I first questioned, like, wait a minute, like, is everything going to be okay? We get to the hospital. Um, they cut everything off. They cut my jersey off. They cut pads off. They drilled my helmet off. Heck, they cut my socks off. I have an MRI that night, and they cool my spine. The next day, I go in for a nine-hour neck surgery. After the neck surgery, they, well, for my neck surgery, they implanted a cage from my C4 to C8 to protect the C5 and C6 vertebrae that, you know, was damaged. After therapy, the very first therapeutic move I did was lifting this hand just like this. This was the very first thing that I did after surgery because I couldn't move anything else. And I remember a therapist telling me like, you know, this is going to be a long like road. This is going to be a hard road. So after 10 days in ICU in Arkansas, I returned to Tulsa. And after three months of intensive rehab, uh, the hospital was ready to, you know, release me, discharge me to go back home and to my life. And it's interesting, you know, the way we think about the hospitals because, you know, when you're in the hospital, you know, when you're feeling bad and you're feeling sick, you're supposed to be in the hospital. That's what we associate being in the hospital with being sick. I am broken. I am sick. That's why I am here. When I leave here, I'm supposed to be better. For me, when they were telling me that I was ready to go, you know, I looked in the mirror. I didn't look better. I didn't feel better. You know, in fact, I thought they had a miss, you know, I, I thought in my head it was a whole, you know, it wasn't the right time because I'm a nurse, like, you know, I don't know if you know this, but I'm supposed to walk out of the hospital, you know, not be wheeled out of the hospital. But they were saying, you know, this is, you know, my stay has run out, you know, and I would, you know, go live life, go back home. But home wasn't home. I couldn't go back to the, to the home that I lived in because... It was on the second story, you know, and life, what life? The life that I was now entering was not the same life that I previously lived for 21 years. So here I was, this is when it really kicked in that this thing that I'm facing is way more than just a physical battle because at that moment I was stuck between a life that was and a life that is. And I can tell you that while I was in the hospital, there are times where I was dreaming and I'm running around the hospital and I would wake up to be a prisoner of my own body in a, in a hospital bed. And in that 10 to 20 seconds of grogginess, trying to decipher, you know, what's real life and what's not real life. You know, surely, you know, me running around is real. You know, then you know, surely me being stuck in this bed is not. You know, you know what is going on right now? 
So, and even, heck, I'll tell you this, in the hospital, I did not watch reality TV because I did not like watching people do things that I felt like I could do. All I, all I watched was Animal Planet because if I saw humans on Animal Planet, at least they were getting eaten by some animal and <laughs> my life didn't seem so bad at the time, you know? And um, it, was, it wasn't until I left the hospital where it was just really, things were setting in because now I'm asking myself these questions of, you know, what am I going to do? You know, football is not, you know, who am I without football? Who am I if I can't walk? You know, you know I'm the only son in my family Who's gonna, can I, will I have children? Will I get married? You know, difficult questions, you know, and it's very, and, you know, sometimes what's happening on the outside is nothing compared to what's happening on the inside. You know, sometimes we, you know, t- pain that you see on the outside doesn't even compare to the pain that you're feeling on the inside. And I'll say that I got to a point where for me, enough was enough, and it was time for a change. You know, sometimes, you know, sometimes, some way in life, we are all fragile. And uh, the question is that when we break, are we wreckage or are we salvaged? You know, are we ruined or are you remade? And here I was asking myself this question, you know, we think of recovery as, you know, going back to the way things were after, you know, you've been broken. But the reality is, once you've been broken, you, there is no going back to the way you were before. You have to, you know, you, you're going to always change after that. You know, you're, change, you can change without growing, but you can't grow without changing. So I knew that, you know, at this point, you know, I, you know again, enough is enough, it's time for change, but it was also time for growth. I was going to remake myself. Like, I did not want to, you know, here at Rock Bottom, what I'm going to do is to try to, you know, recreate, you know, rebuild and rebuild something better than what, you know, went down, you know, on June 6th. So I asked you all the question, you know, what do you do when you've fallen and you can't get up? Let me tell you my answer. When you fall and you can't get up, you can't give up. You know, that is, that was my answer to, you know, falling and you know, not being able to get up. Because again, it wasn't about me getting up physically. I had to really pick, up my, pick myself up by the bootstraps emotionally, spiritually, mentally. It was a, you know, every morning that I woke up, you know, it was a day that I woke up and saying, you know what, I am better than the moment that I'm in right now. I'm going to do something today that you know, you know, gets me further from where I want to be. And um, let me tell you about, or closer to where I want to be. Let me tell you what I did to, you know, in terms of not giving up. Um, that, before that, I'll say this. When I woke up, every day, you know, those first couple of months were really, really hard. But I can remember thinking to myself that I did not live that day that I got hurt to die on this day. And I don't mean that just physically because so many, think about it, you know, so many people are walking around us that are already just dead, you know. We're, we live amongst walking dead people who wake up, you know, I won't even say wake up, I'll say they wake down every day, and it's, oh, this job I'm working, oh, you know, in this relationship I'm in, oh, these kids, they're, you know, they're driving me crazy, you know. And it's time to, you know, for me it was time to wake up and not just look at what's happening around me, but to look further to what could be. And how I did that, I had to first turn on my GPS. If you're familiar with the GPS, you know that the very first thing that comes on when you pop on the GPS is a blue dot that says exactly where you are. And this was the hardest thing that I had to go through because I had to do, go through self-examination. I had to look at myself and see that, okay, Emeka, you are not where you used to be. You are right here on the corner of pain and uncertainty across the street from fear and failure. And having to do that, oh, it was so hard. It was so, so hard because I, I'm closing my eyes because I'm, I'm just remembering these days of just 
really looking at my life and, and understanding that, you know, I had to let go of what was, you know, and, and really just embrace that fear and embrace the, you know, not just feeling the fear, but also facing it. So after, you know, finding out where I was, I had to pop in some coordinates and decide, okay, who am I? You know, I'm rebuilding, you know, where do I want to be? Where do I want to go? What is this new life that I have, you know, going to be made of? Because I say, I say new life because, again, I could easily not be here uh, as I am here. You know, a lot of people, I think that day for me is, I used to think that day was, it used to haunt me as like a, June 6th used to haunt me as a bad day. Like every day that I, it, every year it came around, it was like, oh, you know, this day sucks. You know, I got to a point where it's not that. It's a second birthday for me because on the day that I did not die, I lived and I'm able, you know, every day past that is a blessing for me. So, you know, every, you know, it was what am I going to do? Where am I going to go? And how is this life, how is this new life going to be, you know, worth something? It reminds me of a quote that I heard from Jackie Robinson that says, a life is not a life except for our life is not important except for the impact that it has on other lives. And it clicked. You know what? The important thing about life is people. People are what's important. You know, we, every day we're impacted, we impact or we're impacted by the people that are around us. How am I going to get up? I'm going to, you know, people are going to help me get up. You know, if I, you know, if I'm feeling down about myself, you know what, a quick way to not feel down about myself is to go do something for someone else. So now I had a direction in which I wanted to point my life in, you know. People first, people matter. You know, I want to serve people. That is what's going to be my direction. The next thing I had to do, I had to take the wheel. I had to take responsibility for my life. And I've heard responsibility defined as responding with ability. You know, I went from being a 6'5", 250-pound football player to being an individual with a disability, and I had to stop looking at like the things that I couldn't do, um, because I now I tell people like disability does not affect my ability. What I cannot do does not stop me from doing the things that I can do. And it's amazing how negative your mind can get if you don't like reel it in. You know, I can remember again being in a hospital watching TV and thinking to myself, like, oh, man. You know, watch TV, I'm like, I'm never going to be a construction worker again. I've never in my life wanted to be a construction worker. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have never in my life thought about going out in the hot sun and putting brick, like, not, not to knock it. It's just I've never thought about it. You know, why would I start thinking about the things that I can't do now? You know, so I had to, you know, respond with the ability and take, responsibility for the things that I could do and the things that I could change. And I think when you're wanting to, you know, for me, when, I'm wanting, when, I, when I was wanting to change my life, it was, you know, hitting in the wedge, you know, doing the smaller things and hoping that, in hopes that, you know, bigger things are going to come. Doing what you can do in the moment, you know, and trusting the process that, you know, as I'm faithful in one area of my life, the other area, you know, it'll produce fruit and uh, it'll be fruitful in other areas. For me, that, that meant like getting back into the gym. I started serving at a local youth group, serving in the community, and just doing the things that I could do, of, you know, things that are right in front of me. So a lot of people ask me, do I ever ask, like, why? You know, Mecca, this is a hard thing. You, you ever ask God why or you ever ask why? And I tell them no because when you ask why, you know, why why did this happen to me? Why me? You know, that makes you a victim. You know, it makes it like something happened to me. You know, I like to ask how. You know, how can I use this? How, how can I get from where I am to where I want to be? And for me, when I ask how, that makes me a victor. And that simple perspective change is what helped me find purpose in my pain. You know, we're all going to have pain in life. We all have pain in life. You know, we have little pains, we have big pains. You know, how you frame it is what's going to determine what you do with it because pain can either improve you or it can impede you. And a lot of times we let pain impede us because 
we can feel it right then and there. And we've got to get to a point where our vision is much, you know, deeper, it's much bigger, it's much further than what we feel in the moment. Which brings me to my third point, which is to look in the windshield and not the rear view mirror. There's a reason why in your car, your windshield is as big as it is, and your rear view mirror is as small as it is. But again, in life, a lot of people, you know, find themselves trying to navigate life while looking in the rear view mirror, like, oh man, this person hurt me in my past, so, you know, I guess, you know, I won't, you know, I won't be friendly to the next person. This job, you know, messed me over, so I won't give it 100% in this one. You know, so many people are looking in the rearview mirror of things that past hurts, past pains, past relationships, and it's keeping them from living their vision that they have in their life. I also have a saying that I want to say, live in the vision of your life and not the circumstances of it. It's really easy to feel circumstances. It's really hard to, you know, see the vision and to live in it. For me, I wanted to still impact people. I wanted to, you know, go to school, finish school, but to do those things, I had to stop looking at, you know, what was going on around me because when you focus too much on what's going on, it just distracts you. You know, it, it serves as a distraction and, you know, you can't drive forward looking backwards. Um, I really, you know, I use a lot of car now and I'll tell you guys why in, in a little bit, but um, my lasting thoughts, what I want to say is that for me to move forward in my life, I had to let go of what was to embrace, you know, what is so that I can look forward to what could be. Now that I have found, you know, my purpose in serving other people, I like to say that my purpose, you know, my purpose for serving people is my direction. Passion is what drives me and perspective is what fills my tank. And I say perspective fills the tank because, you know, let's say, for example, you wake up this morning and you're on your way out the door to go to a meeting, go to work, go to your job, and you get a flat tire. That flat tire makes you late, makes you late to this meeting. Let's say at the end of that day, and I, you know, you get asked, how was your day today? That flat tire, I'm pretty sure a flat tire will probably come up in your day. Let's fast forward to the end of your life and let's ask, you know, what was your life about? I highly doubt that a flat tire is going to come up in the grand scheme of your life. And if a flat tire does come up, you ain't doing enough with your life. <laughs> but my point is, when you put certain things in perspective, you know, it, you know when you put your pain in perspective, it will fuel you to, you know, like I said, to improve. Or it can, you know, it can improve you or impede you, pull you or push you. I like, you know, now whenever there's little pains, because there's, again, I wake up every day and six years ago, today is not the same, you know, today and six years ago the same are, are the same in a way where I wake up and I'm still, I haven't been able to walk yet. And I say yet because, you know, that day is coming. But I get up and it, it might be the same, but the one thing I know is that I have to change my thoughts. You've got to change, you've got to, Set your GPS, you've got to, you know, go with that because if you're trying to live in, you know, the ups and downs of what's going on with your day, what's going on with, you know, the people around you, then you're, you're not going to get to the vision that you have for yourself, the vision that you cast for yourself. You know, a lot of people, I read a lot of different um, comments when I got hurt and I saw that, you know, a lot of people were like, you know, it's a tragedy, you know. What a terrible thing to happen to a young man, you know, in the prime of his life, you know. And again, you know, football people, you know, will see that you lost a living, you know. So let's say I would have made a lot of money. I don't regret my accident because the people that I've been able to impact, you know, moving forward from my life from that day, way worth, you know, the pain that I've been through. I, I, if I had a time machine I could go back and change that day, I would not change that day. It's taken a long time to get to the point where I can say that, but I would not change that day because, again, my, you know, the vision for my life, I am living in the vision of my life. I am, you know, the people that I've been able to see, the people, the groups I've been able to talk to, the companies I've been able to see, uh, speak to, I can't, you know, I wouldn't trade that for anything. 
if you leave today and my message has let you change something in your life that impacts other people's lives, then today is worth that day uh, in 2009. Some people will see my life and say that, you know, we'll see maybe I lost a living. But if you look closely, you'll see that I found a life. I've been, you know, six years later, I'll tell you that I've graduated with my undergrad from Lakes University. And in three weeks, I'll start my master's degree at OU Tulsa. And I've been using a lot of car analogies because in December last year, I just, you know, I just got a handicap accessible vehicle that I had to relearn how to drive. But that beautiful car is sitting right outside of this building. You know, uh, thank you. You know, I have been able to rebuild something, you know, for me personally, that has been better than what, you know, I lost um, that day. Again, recovery is not going back to, you know, where you were. It's about getting stronger than, you know, the pain that you've been through. For me, I, it's just all about, it's really all about holding on. Because if you hold on, you know, long enough, you're gonna come out on the other side of things stronger. If I hold on long enough through a school session, you know, I'm gonna come out on the other side of it smarter. And if you hold on to, you know, if you hold on through a thing that, you know, calls you fear long enough, you're gonna come out on the other side courageous. It's all just about not giving up, really. And I mean, for me, that is what, my life has come down to just when in the face of adversity, you just don't give up. When you fall and you feel like you can't get up, you don't give up because there are people that are going to be there to help you up. When, you know, for me, my passion is people, so helping other people up helps me up every single day. And before I leave, I want some more crowd participation. I want you guys to repeat after me. Today I choose, Today I choose. to live in the vision of my life and not the circumstances. Thank you all for letting me come and talk to you guys. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate it. Do I wait a few? Okay. Thank you, Amika. A book recognizing today's program will be presented to our partner in education school. The book is called A Kid President's Guide to Being Awesome. It's actually, I want to take it home. Can I take it home for a few days? Um, please uh, thank our volunteers today. Mark, thanks for doing the camera work. I saw Luann at the guest table. Thank you all. We can't do these meetings without all of our volunteers. Thank you all for attending, and now go out and talk about Rotary. We're adjourned. <laughs>